Hi, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, my name is Corey Fry. I'm the exhibitions manager here at the Delaplaine Art Center. Uh, thanks for being here on a Saturday at our Art Matters talk. Um, this is our Emerging Perspectives talk with Jer Ryan Letourio. Um, a couple of housekeeping things really quick. Uh, we have two new exhibitions that are opening today. You're sitting in one of them, the Emerging Perspectives exhibition. Um, and then there's a show on our second floor in our Hall and Moreland Gallery that's Delaplane faculty. So any of the classes that we have here, um, we've invited faculty from those classes to participate in the exhibition. Really great work. So take some time, wander around, check out the exhibitions. There's also an exhibition called the Betty Awards. It's a high school art competition. Um, that's through, through the door here and off to your left. Uh, there's a side gallery over there. You can check out the work. Um, and that uh, was open through March. So it's continuing this month. Um, if you haven't gotten one of our magazines or if you're interested in getting one in the mail, you can stop by the front desk and they'll put your... Uh, address in our system to get our magazines. We're finishing up stuff for the summer semester, and so we've got a bunch of classes, uh, new exhibitions, artist talks, uh, summer camps for kids, lots of stuff going on. So take some time and check out what we've got going on. The other thing I wanted to mention is we record these talks, and so we've got a backlog of a bunch of talks on YouTube as well if you're interested in checking those out. Or if you know of somebody that's not here uh, that would be interested in the talk today, uh, you can point them in that direction too. Who all is in? Uh, who all is an artist in our emerging perspectives exhibition? Thank you all so much for submitting your work. Um, we're so pleased with the show. I wanted to say just a quick word about emerging perspectives. So, we really believe that you can be an emerging artist at any age. Um, uh, we hold that wholeheartedly. But one thing uh, a couple of years ago that we recognized was we were getting a lot of participation in Youth Art Month, which is March. Uh, we, we, of course, get participation from our, for our Over 70 show, which is over 70 years old and up. And even our National Juried Exhibition, which has no age limit, uh, we were getting a lot of participation from like 35 to 60 year olds. But we, were, we really weren't able to tap into, or we weren't getting a lot of participation from artists in the 18 to 35 year old age range. And so we wanted uh, an exhibition specific towards that age group to kind of, to be more inclusive, to include more people, even though there's the restriction of the age. Um, but we, we understand that that can be a little tricky. Um, uh, but, we're so excited about the exhibition this year and the last three years. We've just gotten a lot of work that uh, it's clear that artists in that age group are trying things, they're like pushing limits, they're trying to figure out stuff. Um, and it's, it's made for really interesting exhibitions. So thank you so much for being a part of the exhibition. We're really excited about it and um, we think y'all are making great work. So that's all I've got to say about that. I'm going to introduce you to Ryan Letourio, our juror, and then he's going to take things over. So Ryan Letourio is an artist, curator, and the assistant professor, uh, an assistant professor in the Arts Foundation program at Virginia Commonwealth University. And he's the director of the Shaco Art Space in Richmond, Virginia. His work has been published in uh, New American Paintings, Beautiful Decay, Sick of the Radio, and Image Journal, and he's exhibited nationally and internationally, including the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art. Would you welcome Ryan Letourio? Let's see if I can get this up for you. All right. All right, thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Well, good, uh, this is good afternoon, good after lunch. Um, so my name is Ryan Letario, and um, one thing I want to say is um, anytime people show up and give their time, like spend your time anywhere, I think it's an honor, and it means a lot. It's not a small thing to say, I'm going to come here today and spend my time. Like it's, you can be spending it anywhere, you know what I mean? So I, I don't take that lightly. I'm honored 
uh, to be able to be here. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to Corey and uh, Delaplane for inviting me to do this. Um, I get to curate a lot of work in uh, my vocational experience. And um, on the flip side, there's this little voice in my head that's like, who am I to be standing here looking at your work, deciding, making decisions? And I think in one sense that's really true. So with humility, curating shows is difficult um, because the scope and the nature of work and the heart and the individualized um, desires that are put forward at any given moment in your life to come to a point to where a stranger looks at it and somehow is going to not only assess and evaluate each piece, but also try to uh, include as many as possible into a space is no small feat and it means that there's uh, subjectivity and fallibility necessarily bound up in that equation. And so um, there's any number of things that could change, um, but with my experience and um, love for the arts, I, I did my best to uh, honor what I saw to the best of my understanding. And so um, coming in and seeing the show physically today has been really exciting. The show and the work that I see is more substantial uh, than, than what it presented online. And I thought it was good online. So what I'm trying to say is sometimes you see, you see things online and then you see them in person and they, they kind of retreat from what you noticed or what you thought was um, effectual and impactful. That hasn't been the case. And so I've walked around and it's only uh, bolstered and, and reasserted many assumptions and experiences that I was having with works through a mediated screen. So um, I think this is a commendable exhibition and uh, really one of the best sort of, um, jury exhibitions are often hit or miss sometimes just to be honest with you. And so like this one is really strong and I wish it was in Richmond where I'm from. Um, so um, I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm not someone who's terribly excited about talking about my own work. I'm very much someone who uh, likes to do things like what, you're, what Corey is doing, what this, this institution is doing, which is to platform artist. But I am gonna give you a little bit of a background on who I am um, and s sort of some highlights of what my work entails both from a personal orientation towards it and a reasonable expectation for what follows from it. Um, and the categories that I'm just gonna talk through quickly are my work um, uh, teaching as a professor and uh, platforming or uh, establishing uh, opportunity for other artists, which is uh, probably the thing that gets me the most excited. Um, but that necessarily flows from my own personal work as a starting point. So it's kind of like what I do as a curator and a professor and someone who's founded a few institutions is um, uh, flows from my studio practice in many ways. In other words, it's like how do you take things and make them uh, and enable them to show themselves well or vibrantly or specifically and, and how can you compound or display rich complexity or diversity, if you will, of aggregate parts that all have something they do or say. And I think um, uh, vision needs to be big enough to encompass a whole. Um, so before I go into my work, I wanna say this to you. My view on the arts is the arts are not ultimate, but they are pervasive. So they're not singularly ultimate such that things live or die on the arts. And that could be a challenging statement for some people. And I'm, I'm happy to talk about anything after. You know, if you wanna poke holes at anything I, I say, please do. I love a good conversation. I'm hopeful for questions, and that's more where I'm comfortable. But I will say to you that I think the arts are pervasive. They're not ultimate, but they are pervasive. And the way I would say it is that from the clothes you wear, art and design, when from the clothes you wear, the plates you eat off of, the name tags you're wearing, uh, uh, I teach people that design typeface so that you can cash your check and know that you're getting the money you want. You know, so like I often tell people like the person's like, I don't get art as they stand uncomfortably with their clothes on. And I'm like, well, you do because you're wearing something someone designed and considered aesthetically for you so that your clothes don't disintegrate as you're walking down the street, which would probably make for a good viral video, but you probably wouldn't enjoy it very much. You know, the building we're in, um, uh, the food, the music that we listen to, uh, think about how pervasive the arts are, art and design. And what you'll find it, to my assessment is, if you remove art and design, you probably would be naked in a desert. There probably wouldn't be anything. And then you could still dance and sing until you maybe just don't have any food and water and then that would be it. Uh, so when people challenge the validity of the arts, I feel like they're looking at the world like this, you know? And so like, I don't, I don't know what to do with the arts. Where do those fit in? And it's like, move your hand away and look and see how integral they are, you know? Like if there wasn't good architecture, we wouldn't be able to stand in this room comfortably, right? 
And if there wasn't good walls, you wouldn't be able to hang your work comfortably. So think about how far back art and design and aesthetics go to ever bring us to a place where we can be looking at work like we are today. Does that, does that kind of track for folks? So um, with the view of the arts that wide, that's why for me it's difficult to single things out because um, I think there's a necessity to the arts that extends beyond genre or uh, modality or um, particular subject matter. And what I'm not saying is in a willy-nilly way. Like, I'm not saying in a cheap and easy way everyone gets to play. I'm saying actually the world is, is um, abounding with um, a richness that must be unfolded and necessitates multi-generational inquiry and investigation into the material world. And I think it's part and parcel to who and what we are. Um, and so um, there needs to be more, not less. And there needs to be critical evaluation so that the thing stands when it's made. And in the arts, uh, we're a little more loose with that. But when it comes to our, our vehicles, I was driving my car today here and it cut off. So I almost didn't think I was gonna be here. So I'm still thinking about getting home safely to Richmond. But when you're driving, you, know, uh, you expect things to work. When you, when you stand in architecture, you expect things to work. So when I come to a painting I, or a drawing or a, photograph, a, a photograph or a sculpture, I expect it to work. The question is, what is it doing and how does it work? Um, and I think that's reasonable because that's the world we live in. When you, when you purchase a hat, you expect it to work. When you put on glasses, you, you check to see if they work. Oh, these don't work. I don't, I don't like how they look or I don't like how I'm seeing through the lens. So um, I think sometimes the arts get put as ultimate and while their position is ultimate, the expectation is evacuated. So we expect less and we elevate them higher. And, we're, and I think what happens is society then doesn't support it. And I, I work at the number one public art school in the country and I'm in this conversation now for 17 years overseeing faculty and curriculum discussion on the future of art education. And I can tell you that the first thing that's removed from the equation is the funding for the arts because the average person is, is blind to how pervasive and supportive and reinforcing art and design is to almost everything we do. Does that make sense? So, so um, the arts extend so far beyond this, uh, this, um, this exhibition in this moment that even if you have one, two, or three paintings in here, it necessitates 10 more from you. Uh, meaning there, there has to be more time and more opportunity and we have to create it. So I just let the computer go out. Sorry, there we go. Okay. Oh, no um, so just want to give you that, that kind of big picture. And then I'm going to give you my uh, uh, amalgamation of a definition of the arts that's workable. Because a lot of times we don't define the arts because we don't think they can be defined. And I just got to say this because I think it's helpful. You can reject it, but I think it's helpful. So I would say that the arts are the suggestion-rich symbolification of objectified meaning. And some of that comes from a much smarter person than me. So if it doesn't work, take it up with them and I'll tell you who they are later. But the suggestion rich nature of the arts is another way of saying they're aesthetic. So aesthetics suggest more than merely the object itself. So if you saw a tree in the woods for the first time and you're the person that figured out how to make paper, the aesthetic nature of a tree had to suggest more than merely being a tree. It didn't compromise its treeness, but it suggested more. Does that make sense to you? So that means that all of reality is suggestion rich. That otherwise you don't take clay and make, or dirt and make clay or pigment. Uh, that is the nature of the world we find ourselves in. And we are necessarily aesthetic people who play with that suggestion. And that necessitates our imagination, which is the working with that which is to imagine which could be, might be, or will be. So as we do that, we start to mess around, but it's serious play, it's not a joke. And the suggestion-rich nature of material forms and fashions into further iterances of uh, substantive communication, symbolified, objectified communication. This, this is an object. There's no question about it. It's there. That's its ontology. And so when we do that, then that uh, expressive form impresses effects on itself that then affect us and impress us with something specific. So art communicates because that's the nature of the world we live in. So I at least want to put that definition on the table because these are things that I think about in my average practice as an artist over the last 30 years. Okay, so bleh. I don't even know what I just said to you. So I'm gonna drink it. <laughs> it um, let me drink, drink some water again and now we'll look at my work. Mm. And um, you may have already caught 
that I'm a little bit, um, I'm either going to joke around too much or I'm going to get too lost in philosophical thoughts. So uh, if it feels a little helter skelter today, that's just who I am. Um, so I, I want to just uh, take you to some early work. I got um, some, some, like some early work from, uh, oh wait, this is a, this is, not, okay, here we go. This is not a Mac, is it? Uh-oh. All right, we got trouble, y'all. I'm not a Mac user, I do not. I mean, I'm a Mac user by virtue of the university, so bear with me. Good thing this music is suddenly playing in the background. It makes me feel more comfortable. So I don't know, this is, I'm just gonna be, I'm gonna show you something from undergraduate, which we're not supposed to do if you're a professor or a professional, so, but I don't care. Um, so, because we gotta be honest, so this is a six by foot painting, and I, I, what I would say to you is, I had been doing art for a long time, and I was wrestling with um, various modalities in figurative work or not figurative work, and all my professors told me that figurative work was a crutch for me. Um, and maybe it was, and maybe it wasn't, but I was in an intense place where, um, uh, philosophy, I mean deep philosophy and ideas and actually painting from observation, landscape painting, painting in Sacramento from California, Southern California, painting in a river or painting at the river and doing a lot of traditional work and then importing optical effects into studio practice work and trying to figure out if I'm learning from this suggestion rich world and I'm trying to import certain effects, how do I do that? And all the while, what I discovered about myself is I was very much a seeker and a questioner of things. Like, is there more to life than merely uh, uh, what I see in front of me? And so um, I was around professors like Oliver Lee Jackson, who's, I think, one of the most important African-American artists in American history right this moment. If you don't know it is, who he is, you should look him up. He's in his late 80s, and he's making his rounds all over the world right now. And he was one of my early professors. Uh, people like Thomas Monteith, um, Stephen Kaltenbach, who's considered the uh, forefather of conceptual art in America. These were, these were my professors, and I didn't know who they were, but I was learning from them. So I was naively engaged in a discourse that was intensely art historical and intensely practical towards the nature of making things. And in that, I was intensely searching for what makes things hold together? Like, why, when I do that, does it stay? Is there, is there more to life than just my mere identity? And, um, you know, is there answers for these philosophical questions? So in my pursuit, I'm, I'm wrestling with science, philosophy, <laughs> religion. You're looking at the history of painting and trying to understand these things. And it's very much a deep and woven portion and part of my story, which could be off-putting for some, some folks as I communicate. And I just ask you to, to consider with an open mind that, you know, we, we come to these points not lightly. And I, I haven't come to any of the places that I'm at lightly. And so I may share some things that could be challenging, but... I express them in love and humility. So I think that we're uh, necessarily made to make. And um, this work was kind of the seminal turning point where I went back to the figure and was trying to loosen it up a little bit. And so um, it's the first work uh, that was in a juried exhibition in the state of California, uh, in this exhibition in the state of California, uh, where it was purchased by a major collector. And so it was my first foray into what some of you may be dealing with now with someone else standing up saying things like I'm saying, and, and then someone bought this six foot by eight foot painting, which was baffling to me. Um, and then I was told I sold it for too little. Um, so um, I just wanna be humble enough to show you, humble beginnings, whoops. Um, my work as I entered into interest in um, religion, uh, particularly uh, uh, Christian religion and faith, um, and architecture, altarpieces, uh, Baroque painting, Renaissance painting, and architecture, um, and how altarpieces both aspire to support the interior narratives in a religious and spiritual context while also grappling with or grasping for the surrounding architecture in an attempt to harmonize an immersive experience. Very intrigued by this idea of immersive experiences 20 something years ago. And so, um, and so uh, I started making, um, pieces uh, that um, were uh, ridiculously shaped. And, and you know, this is like 186 feet wide, multiple pieces. And kind of like uh, the way I like to colloquially uh, phrase it is like I was a kitchen sink painter. 
So I'll just put everything in but the kitchen sink, uh, only because I couldn't find one. Um, but uh, let's see here. Yeah, I did not. I did not anticipate the uh, the not. Um, so just as, as I'm scrolling through, I just want you to see. So I'm dealing with religious ideas, religious <laughs> connotations from historic paintings, and this idea of like, what does it mean to make painting that deals with being very physical and in present tense, while suggestive of something elusive and more than what it merely is in an architectural uh, context. That sounds really lofty. That doesn't mean that that happened or that, that, um, that I achieved those things, but that was uh, the sincere private ambition of my work, if that makes sense. Um, and, um, and so as the work matured or developed, um, I moved from making uh, multiple objects and to synthesizing them into singular objects. And for me, uh, I grew up interested in comic books, California kid, my parents were like into lowrider cars, my dad was, my stepdad was, was coming out of being like a gangbanger, like my family was not into education or college, my mom was kind of punk rock, she's pretty awesome, she's kind of tough, like in the 70s she had tattoos when it wasn't cool. And so I grew up in a pretty interesting environment for aesthetics, and comic books were like this thing that I never read but I always looked at. And so, and I was always interested in the relationship of the image to the frame, and, um, and how suggestive that was, how potent and powerful that was for me as a kid who was riding skateboards, break dancing in 1980, listening to hip hop music and listening to uh, like heavy metal. So I was a very uh, blended kid in terms of cultural experience early on. So that blended collision of cultural items was always something I was trying to reconcile in the picture plane. Like how do these things fit together? Because I experienced it, how does it work? So as my work was maturing, um, I was looking at uh, um, comic book imagery as like, almost like mythology that was uh, unique to my own cultural experience. So rather than like amplified humanity through, or through Greek mythology, it's kind of like the moral tales of like superhero characters. You know, that one minute are a villain, the next minute they're not. And how do you reconcile that if you're the kid trying to process this information? So a lot of my work is working against those ideas and then aspiring towards some of the ideas that you see uh, roundedly displayed in, in religious painting. If you have a question too, please feel free to ask. So just to kind of give you an aesthetic, I don't, I don't want to have to explain too much um, in terms of what these are, but just so your, your eyes can see kind of what I was wrestling with. So like, in, if you look at this painting, it's, it's these kind of quasi hero characters that are both embodying painterly values that have uh, signifying meaning depending on which part in our history that they come from. And then in the center is a little picture of like a, a flat painting of, of the Christ figure uh, kind of quietly looking directly at you, uh, fixing, fixing your gaze on it in the midst of a kind of uh, aggregate uh, relationship of disparate images. Um, when I move from, so maybe here's one more and then I'll, I'll move a little faster here just to kind of give us so one of the things that I found is, that I, I, and I advise this to an artist is, don't be afraid to just embrace the things you're afraid of and, and remove the things you're good at. So when you're making, make to your strength, but also make to your weakness and let it live for a while and let it live and breathe in your studio. And so I would do that, I would practice that, I would not hide the things I was, if, like if I was nervous to make something or embarrassed of it, I'd actually pursue it. Because I found that there must be a reason why I'm afraid of it. And so if I could do that, then it may become something valuable to the uh, larger makeup of my work. It may give me a future opportunity if I'm, not, if I'm not suppressing it. So a lot of little, little things that I was doing were like, man, I just wanna make a simple little thing, like a painting that has like this, this bit of information down here or just this right here. But I didn't feel secure enough as an artist to take the risk to make simple things. So one of the things that started to happen uh, later for me is I embraced the simplicity and the maximalism of my work and didn't apologize for it. And so this is sort of seeding the soil for aesthetic possibilities that I'm, I'm now, as a, you know, 20, you know, 15, 20 years later, playing with or working with. So I moved from California and went to VCU, so the number one public art school in the country. All that to say, it's just a fancy place where a lot of people are drawn and so you get to meet a lot of your heroes. Um, and uh, there's a lot of excitement, especially early on. And so um, my interest in complexity went from making paintings to objects that could immerse people in that space. 
still wrestling with um, uh, religious ideas. So this painting in the back is called Barah. So in the Christian tradition, uh, the, in Genesis, it says that God barad all things out of nothing. Out of no thing, all things exist and uphold by the power of God's word. That's the idea. And then in, in, when humanity comes to make things they saw, they make out of what already exists. So they make with, and, and then there's make out of. And that's just a perplexing idea to me that's very interesting. Also, this show is called Kingdom Come Possible, which is a philosophical idea of a possible world that makes all of these pieces possible in this religious idea. So, um, but I grew up in like Venice Beach, and I don't know how much, how many of you know about Venice Beach, or uh, it's a pretty wild place, especially in the 80s, very wild. Um, it's the, one of the most eclectic environments that you can imagine, where there's street performers. I think Whoopi Goldberg, when I was little, was getting her start on the street. Now she's on The View. So that's an amazing thought. Homeless, now on The View, super powerful, right? So you're seeing this happen constantly, and it's just all up for grabs. And you see people like street performers performing tireless, tirelessly illusions of transcendence, illusions of significance, illusions of more than what they merely are, while they're being worn down by the very act itself, convincing others to buy into the act. You know, and I, I love magic, so uh, I wanted to talk about my own uh, concerns, but also I think the concerns of all of us. So you grew up around like things like Disneyland, and you go there, and Disney had a utopic vision, and you go to the utopic vision, and you can see the cracks in things, and you have to have willf willful suspension of, of disbelief to buy into it, and you have to buy into it here and here, and then in your pocket, you know, here, you know, you got to buy into it. And it's like, is there more than that? Is there something that doesn't peel, you know, that, that I don't have to pay to buy into, that, that buys into me, if you will. And so in this uh, body of work, you know, I'm looking at things like um, the street performer who's performing the trick of levitation, but it's really being worn down by the act. And so it only works for them, provided you believe in them. Um, and then... Uh, this kind of like monorail is a metaphorical idea that unites utopia. So if you go to Disneyland, you get on the monorail, and then you, you circumscribe the, the, the utopia, and somehow that's what's holding it together. Um, and, and, and so the idea of a monorail up on blocks that's been stripped of all of its power and its value and looks like it's kind of on the street corner was kind of my own aesthetic experience and spoke to some of, some of the modern ambitions that I think we, we're coming out of. Uh, from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, this idea that we could transcend ourselves and, and the arts could lead the way. And I found that the arts, they kind of don't do that, but we do carry them forward in significant ways. That's why I meant they're not ultimate, but they are pervasive, and provided we care, they're enduring. So it's kind of a critique on the arts, but it's a <laughs> critique on material culture, and it's a critique on, um, it's, it's also an adoration for embodied expressive materiality. It's a, it's a contradiction in that sense. Um, one of the things that I found interesting is the relationship between word and text, uh, or word and image, so that words have a role to play in relationship to image. And I think, I'll just say this to you, I think that images are worth a thousand words and words are worth a thousand images, that they're necessarily mutually enhanced of each other. Um, so, you know, my work, coming out of here, aspired more so to object, and then um, objects became smaller objects, reduced objects, uh, textural objects, humorous objects, like looking at soap dispensers and seeing paintings instead of soap dispensers, um, which is like a pun on modernism and a pun on uh, irreducible complexity and um, uh, minimalism. Um, but also finding that like art can be serious and funny. And that should be okay. Like a miniature house made for the sky that's cantilevered out into a gallery space. Um, and like why I did that, I don't know. But I thought it was funny. Um, and I found that sometimes art was so serious that there wasn't room for fun, but fun is serious, so why can't I try to have some humor in the work? Um, I will say to you that like coming out of grad school, space becomes an issue and I had to start making paintings, uh, not in a big studio, but in a card table. And so instead of complaining about it, I was thankful and just started making paintings that could fit 
on a card table and then sit in my car kind of the way you'd put a record in your car. You know, you carry a record, it's portable. So it's like, okay, if I can make paintings that are like an album that can distill some of those little ideas that I showed you that I was pointing to earlier in those paintings, maybe, maybe that'll be something sufficient and satisfying to me poetically, aesthetically, creatively. So um, I found that uh, my work became uh, more visual and uh, more for your eyes the way jazz or music is for your ears. It doesn't have to have total explanation. It's just, do you, do you vibe with it or not? Does it impress any, anything upon you or not? Um, also, the realization that people, people, artists, sometimes we can be pretty narcissistic in that we want our ideas reinforced, and you can't reinforce everyone's ideas. Just like you can't serve someone the meal that is every meal. It's, it's simply not possible. And so once I felt free from this idea that I had to please everyone, then I could just make the things in good conscience and humility that I could make and know that I'm glad that someone else is making what I can't or won't or don't want to make. You know, so gratitude started to pervade my thinking um, and um, freed me from the pressure of having to please others or anticipate others' expectations or desires. Otherwise, I don't even think I could be standing here and talking uh, in front of you all because it's just too terrifying. Um, so um, my work became more, I'll use this painting since it was on the, I'm gonna talk about this painting and I'll show you a few others and I'm gonna shift over to what else I do and then we can open up questions. So, so I, have, I hold to a very particular faith perspective at this point. My life was changed at a certain point so I, I am a person who holds to a reformed Christian perspective and uh, some of the ideas that I find compelling in that are how reality, if you consider it, can be both uh, eminent and transcend at the same time. So you can have eminent experience, like we're all ontologically present in this moment, but your mind could be very far from this moment. Like you could, you could just be hearing Charlie Brown talking right now. Blah, 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 blah. What is this gray haired old dude talking about? And yet I'm still embodied and I'm still very present to you. That value plus the transcendent value to me is a very compelling idea. Uh, it's a very compelling theological idea. It's a very compelling philosophical idea. And I think it has a lot of import and it's worth discussion. And in our polarized America, where everything is like um, political in a very detrimental way sometimes, discussion is gone. And I think the arts have a way of positioning us for real discussion, even real agreement, without emotions being inflamed and without uh, irreconcilable differences being put forward in place of the way an object or a painting can organize a conversation. So, so my work in the framing is about establishing uh, a present tense expression that doesn't have any suggestion to something escapist in the interior. So painting historically has been like a window for escape. And there's a point where people thought of paintings as an escape um, and therefore they needed to put frames on it so people weren't lost to the painting. You know, if you go back and you read about it, it's like, oh, we gotta put a painting on there, a frame on there, so people aren't confused by the Trump Lowell special effects. <laughs> However, there's a point where then the, the, the demand was, well, the, the frame can't integrate with the painting too much because now it's confusing what the painting is. So they started to make the frames more gaudy and distinctive, almost disjunctive, so that there's clarity. And then you get to the modernists and they're like, screw the painting, it's just about the object. We don't want it to speak to anything beyond itself. And so, so you throw out the baby with the bathwater and now you've got paintings with no frame, no border, no nothing. And so for me, philosophically, taking the ideas of um, the frame and the ideas of uh, the window, but also the ideas of gesture abstraction and harmonizing those to say that the frame, it has an effect of being present tense and holds you in place enough to imagine what's going on suggestively beyond that. And again, whether those are successful every time in my paintings, that's the motivating idea that I find most compelling. Think about it this way. You are structured as skeleton and then flesh is housed on you and depending on what you believe, which I believe we have a soul, well, that soul and that imagination are operating. You know, when you, when you go home and you sleep at night, where does your imagination go? Your desires kick into your mind and you aspire to be something more than maybe you are. You know, like how many times have we thought like that? Like, if I could just become this, then I'd be that. Some of you might be here like, if I could just get into the show and someone sees it, maybe I'll get a show. And you, you envision that, right? Well, how can you envision that unless you're located in a body stationed in a particular place that affords that. And I think that idea is really worth um, standing on 
at a time where, you know, I work in a place where we're aggressively pushing for transhumanism and work towards having your conscience completely removed from your body. So uh, that raises questions about what humanity is. Um, like, what are we anthropologically? Like, those are questions we need to wrestle with. And I, I fear we're not wrestling with them. So in my own small, humble way, I want my work to, to, to cause us to wrestle even if it's just me and a friend standing here going, dude, you're, you're dumb. Like, I don't even see what you're talking about. Okay, cool, let's talk about it. Cool, you think it sucks. All right, why? Tell me why. Why does it suck? If I can do that and we can do that, that's a win in my mind. Um, and I think that uh, visual art has the ability to affect in real ways and tangibilize these kinds of conversations. Like liquid philosophy frozen within the embedded effects of time and space happening right before your eyes and qualitatively Time leaves you as you stand before something great. That's an incredible experience if you've had it. I think that's what art affords us. But then the question is, why are we afforded that experience? That's a question we should ask. And I, 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 in my experience of a lot of years teaching and, and being in the arts and curating art shows and founding an art gallery and then also founding a theological institute that comes in 2024, these are questions that we're not asking. Okay, so... That's a huge ramble, and I'll unpack whatever. Teaching is a part of the equation for me. We're almost done. Teaching is, is big for me. Teaching for, you know, there's the whole, those who teach can't do, it's just an, a, a lie. Uh, they're utterly necessary. It's like uh, they, they mutually enhance each other. They're part of one totality. And so I teach freshmen at VCU, and I find that people, humans, are so capable of learning when their ideas of the arts are put into, into place. Like imagine if your identity is an artist and you have to hold your identity like this. So what that means is if you're holding it, you can't give a hand to anything else. Because if you do that, you'll drop it. So a lot of us are working really hard to hold our identities. And so that means that we don't have hands to do anything else. And so it's very difficult to like have a family, uh, be a neighbor, cook a meal, pay your bills. You know, like I remember being so anxious, I get a phone call and then I'd like collapse, like I can't answer the phone. It's too stressful, you know? My wife would be like, what's wrong with you? It's like, they're calling me, you know? Like, there used to be a time when you got excited and someone knocked on your door. That's not the case anymore. I'm like, I got time for that. I don't know who that is, and I don't wanna know. You know, like, I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember the last time I answered my phone on principle. You know what I mean? Like, like, you could be my friend and call me and I'll wait for it to go to the answering machine and then I'll call you back. So something is changing with us. Do you know, what, like, we, there's something going on. And so, um, I think when our identities are totally only in our hands, we're not strong enough to hold it. Because I have to convince you to believe in me. Do you know how hard that is? Especially when that person is trying to convince you to believe in them. I think that's probably why we're polarized. I think that's why we're fighting so hard. So for me, in my perspective, uh, um, as, a, as a Christian, my, my, my value is upheld by something more than me. And I'm humble enough to realize it wasn't given to me other than by grace. So I can put my hands down and say, hey, here's this taco I made for you. Would you like a bite? I gotta hold my identity up. I'm free. Like, I don't gotta prove myself. I don't gotta protect myself. I'm just kind of like a dude with bedhead uh, who woke up this morning and told a fart joke to my kids. I make paintings and I like to think about weird stuff. You know what I mean? Like, and it's okay if you don't like it. And I think if we were freer, we could get more done in a way that actually sets a fire in the hearts of others to experience that same freedom. But we can't, we can't do it if we're holding our identities up too long. It's just too difficult. So imagine someone else holding it for you, and imagine you being more than merely an artist. Well, not, not being an artist. And I think there's too much pressure on it. So what I find is when you address these issues, 18-year-olds come in, in a half a semester, they start making double portraits like the ones you're seeing in just two months. And they make those drawings in just two weeks. And these are 30 by 44 inch drawings. Not so that they can be a realistic artist, but so they can conquer giants that they think are giants. Only to find out that they're not. They're just part of your ability to grow if you're willing. And so I find a lot of artists are holding their identities up, which means they can't afford to grow. So art can be like, I want the rock star benefits of being an artist, or I want the therapy that comes from it. Both are not bad things, but both of those can rob you of the ability of actually learning because you kind of have to die to yourself a little bit and let down your guard to grow. That's very hard, but statistically, the people that can grasp that are the ones that tend to have the enduring career as an artist. 
being at a high level institution means that I have photographers who come in who never drew, like this person here. Or people that are in their 40s that come back after not getting a chance to go to college because, because of uh, various social issues that are like, I gotta learn with 18 year olds. And so um, I find great joy in breaking bread and sharing with confidence the good things that I think we can know about the world because I think the world's knowable. So as a Christian, for me, the art is spoken and upheld by the power of God. Like I think everything is speech. Everything is physical and spoken and it's here because it's been said so. It's up here, it's, it's right there. Those chairs are not going away because they're spoken and they're enduring and they're persistent. And so I think that creates a compelling reason for the arts, that actually the arts are part of our, our, I think our calling and our purpose as people. We're meant to make things that evoke and establish a furtherance of our imaginations, our life, our, our connections, and our understanding of the world we find ourselves in, and what inhibits us from always delighting and rejoicing in that which I think is a very complicated issue, but I'm happy to talk about it later. So in conversation with students, you have people, um, this is an example of someone who was a graphic designer and started to learn and was staggered by her ability to learn when she was freed up to the point where as she was drawing, she was in tears because she's never experienced it before. She didn't think she could learn physically in her body with physical material out here, having staged these images for herself. So you start to see complexity and form and light and space, these ingredients we all cook with. Like think about how form, light and space is here. If there's no lights in here, we're not sitting in here. We can't see anything. And so these common ingredients that uh, we all cook with, uh, whether we want to admit it or not, unite us in so many ways. Um, so teaching for me is significant because it has something to do with how the next culture uh, emerges. And I think if we don't share the wealth we've been given, then we lose it and it dies on the vine. And I'm grateful for the professors I had like Olive Lee Jackson that taught me. So I carry their legacy forward even to you now by mentioning their name and honoring them. And the, so that means that the arts are not ultimate and they're also not exclusive to you. Um, so you've been given a stewardship and a chance to cultivate and, and carry it forward. Um, so so uh, yeah, just to kind of give you an overview of just, this is just stuff that's happening in a standard drawing class in a university that I'm very passionate about and I, I believe very deeply in. And I've seen people's lives change by learning to engage with the physical world and not vacate it, but actually learn what it does. And wherever there's problems in your work, if you start to embrace those as, oppor as opportunities, you'll find yourself learning. So when something is depressing and problematic and doesn't reinforce your identity, get excited because maybe it's demanding more of you than what your, the thinness of your identity can deal with. That means that maybe your identity should be larger than what you think. Maybe you're not a reduction, maybe you're actually more, and you can't know that more in just one instant, but you have to live it out as a process. How many things do you know happen in an instant? Not very many, right? But gardens grow over time with sunlight as seeds break underground and are, are, are lifted out of the soil. I think that's the way artists should think of themselves. We tend to sometimes think of ourselves as like food put in a microwave. Uh, that could take 10 hours, but if we put it in a microwave, boom, we're done. I don't think it works that way. A lot of us know that because you're making stuff and you know it took time. The, the best part about it too is it's gotta be worth your time because let's say you spend two months in a painting and then I come see it in three seconds. It better be worth your time because I'm not gonna give it three hours, let alone three months. So there's a trade-off, you know? Three, three years for a movie for me to watch it in two and throw popcorn at it. That's a heck of a, that's a, heck of a risk. You know what I mean? That's a risk. Like, do I want, do I want to, put myself and what I, what I have here in front of people that are gonna be like, you know, like, look at that. And that's my favorite. I run a gallery and people walk in and they're like, you know, there's that guy, the comedian, he walks around going, and he goes into a, he goes into a museum and does that and it just tickles me to death. Cause I'm like, that's so real. Like people do that. Like, God bless them, man. You need, you need haters. You gotta have haters. Um, also, I, I, what I'm trying to say is like, this is a freshman who's getting a C in my class. That's a 17 foot drawing done in two weeks. We should be better at making art. Not so we can make realism, so we can make art. And what I'm trying to challenge and invite you to is, if you can get out, out of the way of yourself, you can do a lot more. Um, and, um, and I see that ambition in here, which I'm really pleased to see. And again, who am I? Like, I'm just some dude that got, invi <laughs> that got invited here, who's been fortunate and lucky enough to be in certain places at the right time. I think there's bigger things happening than just merely me, so I'm just humbled and grateful. 
and I'm honored to be standing in front of so many uh, excellent artists. I mean, as colleagues and as peers, whether you're emergent or not, like we're probably all gonna maintain emergency. Uh, my grandfather was 94 when he passed and his eyes and his hands and his eyes were going and he used to sit on the porch in Venice Beach and make these drawings that looked like tracings that were childlike, but he was serious about it. In his mind, he was still emerging. I believe that he was. You know, so I, I pray that we never lose sight of what it means to grow and learn and emerge as an artist. And what a gift that a place like this would recognize an invitation was needed to bring you all together distinctly to where we don't have to feel like people that are 36 or above like me are excluded. Like I don't feel excluded. I'm grateful that you, you had wisdom to make a choice to do a show like this. Like we need that kind of wisdom to be able to say everyone's welcome but not everyone can sit at the table every meal. You know, we, no restaurant provides that, no dinner table provides that. But in general, all are welcome. Um, so I'll just say, Chaco Art Space is a gallery I run. You're welcome to talk to me about that later, but I'd like to stop there and open up for questions or stop completely because I don't know what time it is. 13 minutes. Okay. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them or try. Conversation. That's a great, oh, that's great. Okay, so because they weren't doing, they weren't doing any work. They, 17 feet isn't work? That's when they finally got it. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, 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 they're, they're wonderful, they ended up doing, they're, they're doing well. Um, they weren't showing up to class. No. They weren't turning their homework. Okay. So it comes back to desire. A lot of people, des a lot of people desire the benefits that are socially attached to being an artist, but they don't want to do the work. And a lot of folks don't know that until they're put in a position where they have to persist doing the work. And it causes panic and a reevaluation of, of who am I and what am I doing here. And because I work in a high level place, you see people with high level expectation that are not necessarily prepared to do the enduring work. They want the benefits. They want to say, I'm an artist. Okay, what does that mean? I don't know. I just, I'm an artist. I'm different. I'm, ex I'm eccentric. I'm interesting. 70% of all people that go to art school after they graduate in four years quit, 70%. The remainder go to uh, MFAs. 90% after MFAs quit. Of the remaining 10%, 4% end up like me, exhibiting and being a professor, and then the other are working in adjacent fields, and then maybe like 8.8% are like uh, someone that I know that sells, that gets paid by Pace Gallery $250,000 a month just cause and then they sell their paintings for $100,000, $200,000. You know, like, that's so rare. Um, and we have such a skewed view of the arts that we don't know how to support more artists. So we support the celebrity. And so that everybody is like, I gotta, I gotta act like a celebrity. I want those social benefits. Yeah, but you gotta know how to make things. You can't reap a crop from a garden and say I'm a farmer if you've never planted or grown anything. So a lot of artists come in with the idea of an artist, but not the heart. Some people, though, discover it, and I think that's a loving thing, because it's not an easy thing to do in our cultural context, unless you got hard for it. I would say if you're called to it. If you're called to it, you'll have opportunity, you'll have capacity, you'll have confirmation from others, and you'll have uh, what I would call uh, affinity or strong desire. But not so much that it, it compromises your life, but that it actually flourishes it. What was your <coughs> criteria uh, for selecting Yeah, that you did? that's a great question. So uh, glad you asked. My first move always, so I served on admissions at BCU from 2009 to 2020, so I'm looking at 2,000 applications a year. And then I'm recruiting people and visiting people with people, and I'm curating at a, a, I funded a nonprofit, so I've been curating shows for a long, long time. And then just hanging out with my friends, looking at art, just consuming it. So there is a lexicon of visual communication in the background that starts to establish qualitative visual pillars. It's kind of like anything else. Any knowledge base starts with knowing something and then reinforcing it by further knowledge. Is that, is that fair to say, like if you're gonna become a mathematician, certain things become more established and it becomes a lexicon of understanding that you can work from, from humbly and reasonably, if you will. So there's that, uh, you know, 30 years of engagement and then earlier. Um, and then there's me bringing that and I, my first move is to look at every person, just their visual work. Not, not who they are, where they come from, just their work to give the work a chance to really establish itself multiple times through. So 
looking through the totality of everything over and over again. And then you're looking at um, the reasonable amount of space that's available and um, a, a reflection of the greatest amount of diverse availability within what's presented and then qualitative criterion for um, unity or commonality and simultaneous distinction. Like, like there's a lot of people that are employing similar techniques for oil painting and realism, but their departures are very interesting. So they've got a unity in, in how they're approaching uh, uh, things like a walkthrough and point a lot out, and then they have points of departure. Um, then you're looking at what's the available range of, of sculpture and what you would call like artistic design craftsmanship, kind of a wedding of those. So you're looking at uh, technical proficiency, um, relative uh, suggestiveness beyond technical proficiency. How much does like how much does that suggest more than its own technical proficiency? Like I distinctly remember that piece. Um, and then you're looking at in, in the reverse things that by comparison just simply sent, tend to step to the back. They don't deliver in every way against the average of what you're seeing. Um, and so, so then you start to pull things back that just don't hold all the weight that the average work in this whole suite does, which is, which is there's a lot more to that visual criterion, but it's composition, effects, affects, dynamics, mechanics. What are the mechanics of the thing? Qualitatively, how do they work? So like, you know, I could look at a, I could look at a painting and find visual things that are happening in the painting. Like, you see how that yellow umber in the center of the bottom of that painting there? You, so when, where that pushes forward, it flattens the flowers and the uh, foliage just above it. And then look to the bottom, look to the left corner. Look how bulbous and round and forward that is. Otherworldly. So I would say that's an excellent work, but I would also say that there's a form, if I could just be goofy and say, this is how I'm doing it. You see this right here? That links with that and collapses their quality. They become the same picture plane, but that's not what the artist wants. The artist wants these to be ground and foot set back. So this color and that color are collapsing the form and flattening something. But then over here, because it gathers and removes from this color, it starts to bulge. So I'm looking at the effects of the painting. Now, if you're, if you're the artist, I'm not criticizing you or saying you didn't do a good job. I'm just saying that your work has an effect. You know what the effects are. So that's what I'm looking at. What are the effects relative to the thing presented? Does that, that kind of make sense? It's just like an on-the-fly example. Um, yeah. What about the opposite? Uh, did you see pieces that you thought were better, for lack of other words, than the previous <coughs> works, and that therefore was not appropriate for the show? Like, oh, you mean like works that were so good they weren't appropriate for the show? Oh, no, no, no. You're, you're, you're always trying to get the most in. Um, and you, you welcome anything that could, again, go back to my first statement. There's a subjectivity that's unavoidable. And so you can't, uh, like, I'm not God. I can't, like, I can only do, uh, in, you know, provided I had good coffee that day and didn't have a stomach ache. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe I had some Taco Bell and that, that helps me out. Um, uh, I can only do my best, right, to be as objective. So the question is, do I have enough credibility in understanding that I'm trustworthy with a, a reasonable read, a credible and reasonable read. And so that's what I would, that's what I would submit to you from experience um, in the positions that I'm in and, and the years of doing it, I, I'm fairly reasonable and fair-minded. And because my view of the arts is so big, I, I don't have an aesthetic agenda. I don't have a preference, actually, like I really don't. Um, so I'm not looking based on my preferences. I'm kind of looking at things, which is countercultural. We're very personal and emotive and subjective. I'm kind of like an oddball. I'm like objective, sometimes impersonal, and I, and, and I want to see what's there. Whether or not I, I like it or not doesn't matter to me. I want to know what it does. I think that would be your ideal. Yeah, I think, and I think it's lost, but I think it is. So if something, there's several, I think, I, I'm not saying this to say it. I mean this sincerely. I can tell you, I won't name names, but there's shows that I've juried where I'm like, this is cool, I'm, I'm glad to be here. And who am I, right? My work's not the greatest ever. But this is actually a quite, really is a good show and um, deeply conflicted about how many good pieces there were because I was like, this makes it really hard actually. But I guess that's a good problem to have, you know? Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So um, all situations are subjectively conditioned forever and ever. Always have been, always will be. Time has to do with qual time is an accidental phenomenon to the qualitative state of our being. So you're having a good time, time goes quickly. You're having a bad time, what does time do? Drags. So what do you do? You get depressed and go to sleep so you can kind of short, shortcut time so you don't have to live in that qualitative experience. So making art and time are curious conversations to have. So time could be a factor, but let's say I've been painting for 20 years and I've got so much uh, haptic or tacit knowledge, um, epistemic ability, that I make a painting that works well in 20 minutes. Well, is that valid or not? I would say yes, because you've got 20 years of working at that moment. You know, it's the airplane pilot that landed in Hudson. And they're like, how did you know to do that? Well, he'd been practicing it for 30 years. So in the, when the moment came, he could do it. He didn't know how to do it in that moment. He's known how to do it, so when the moment came, he was ready. So I think that that's at play with artists. Um, I, I obviously, opportunity uh, factors in. And there's never, this is terribly unpopular, but there's never a time, I grew up poor. I grew up in a mostly Hispanic and African-American neighborhoods. Um, and a lot of opportunities weren't afforded to most of us. And so you have two options. You know, like I could be the kid who was like, I'm gonna get rich one day and I hate this. Or I stubbornly was like, I love this. And I like how that billboard looks. And I like the rusty car right there. And I'm gonna make paintings that point to this in humanized ways. And if I can't get an opportunity to talk about it in an established place, I'm gonna gather my friends and we're gonna go make a new place, which is literally what I've been doing my whole life. It's like, hey, how can I platform other people? And so art history is not neat and it's not clean. Like I'll give you an example. Someone that's interested in coming to the institution that we're launching is from Poland. And we met with her and they're under communism. Her story is incredible. And there is a time where Poland didn't exist on the map politically. So she brings out a book and starts showing me all these Polish artists I've never heard of that you would, it's not in the canon. And the, the work was staggering. And immediately my lexicon of art history is being shifted and I'm platforming her. So now what that means is we have a chance to start something in Poland because we're talking about it and we're going to platform what she brought to bear. So it took what it took to get to the point where that could happen. And I think that's the most that we can do in, in the heart of your question. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't believe in luck, that's just me. I just believe in providence. I believe in meticulous providence. I think things happen when they do. And I think that that's a very demanding statement that requires a lot more conversation. But I understand what you're saying and I respect it. And, um, and, and then I think like, if we're not looking for social value, there is a world of possibility as far as creation goes. But if we're looking for validation from our identity, we may, we may become reductionistic to the people that we actually don't want approval from anyways. And I think that's one of the social tensions we live in. And I don't know all the answers to that. You know what I mean? Like, pfft, I'm, get, I'm getting old fast. So I'm like, I'm running out of time. You know, these are, these are big questions. So yeah, other, other questions? Yeah. How, how do you get over that fine line of uh, knowing when to peak is coming? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a great question, and every, everybody in here already knows the answer to that, and so we're good. No, I'm kidding. We, we all know. <laughs> we all know. Yeah. No, like, right? Like, um, anecdotally, I've found that when you start slowing down and you don't know what to do anymore, the work is telling you I'm near done. You know, it's like, it's like uh, I have kids. My daughter's 14, and she's starting to tell me things like, I got it, Dad. I'm like, wait, wait, you got it, you got it? And I'm like, oh, you do got it. You know, and I think in a way, uh, a work will be like, got it. I'm done right there. You ain't got to touch me anymore. That's so unsatisfying. It's so like, but there is a point where you do slow down. I will say to you, though, um, there is something that you might think in these categories. I can share, share, with, share them with you later. Uh, there's Aristotelian categories, the four causes. So there's the um, cause, meaning uh, a thing that makes another thing happen. So one is your, uh, f your, you have your final cause, the end goal, your telos. You have your material cause, or that's, and then you have your formal cause, 
And, um, oh my gosh, I'm gonna forget the third. But one is like, what do you, uh, your, so your material cause is the raw materials out of which you make something. Your final cause is what you're making. Your um, design cause, if you will, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's, it's the process by which the thing is made that we recognize it as that thing. So you know like in, Chile, in Willy Wonka, you ever seen that movie? The chocolate conveyor belt? Chocolate is, is raw and being poured into shapes and that pattern shape when recognized as chocolate bar and then, and then that moves to the wrapping and then it moves to the final cause, which is the goal, which is what? To consume it and have a happy tongue. Not even a happy tummy, it's just a tongue. So, so what I'm saying is that process understood together to greater extents doesn't foreclose on surprise elements in the outcome, but it gives you reasonable expectation for what effect you want to impress upon someone. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm, I'm, an, I'm an odd bird, like, um, like I made a documentary because I wanted to stimulate the Richmond art scene to be inclusive to more uh, curators and collectors because there was an elitism that I thought was a problem. And so I, I had a friend who was bartering with me and he's an art collector, but he was a contractor and a lot of his guys were in and out of prison and tough gangsta guys. Yeah. And, and Don is like, tough man but he's got this collection of art that no one knows about, and half of it's stuff that's in the museum in Richmond. And he bartered with me to help build my studio, and he was so moved by one of my paintings that he bartered his work for my painting. And the painting was in a book, and he had almost had tears in his eyes. He's like, I was like, you can have the book too. He's like, I get the book, Ryan? And so he did it, and I was like, man, Don, I'm gonna make a movie, of, I'm gonna make a movie about you, because we need to see this. I'm like, you make the walls that allow people like me to hang our paintings. That should be celebrated. And so um, I made that documentary just for Richmond. It was me and a friend. It was supposed to be 15 minutes long. It turned into an hour. And then it traveled into um, film festivals. And it went around the world. And it won awards. And it just kept propagating. And like that wasn't made for money. That was made because a story needed to be told. And I wanted to honor the man in the story and stimulate the community and not just condescend what I thought was arrogance in a, in a people, but offer an alternative. So if you want to support financially those kinds of things, I can live with that. Do you know what I mean? Because, because it's, yeah. it extends to include more than this, my, this myself. So when it comes to selling paintings, I've wrestled with that. I've never, I've resisted signing on with a gallery. I've had opportunities and I turned it down. And, and that means that a lot of times people end up trading with me. Um, and I'm not, anti, I'm not anti making money. If someone needs to make money to support their art, I believe you need to do that and not feel bad about it. Because if you feel bad about it, there's 900 more people that don't. And they're not even as good as you, you know? So if you're a person of conscience, that comes back to calling. Maybe you're not called to be commercial in that way. But perhaps it's a finer issue, invitation, that you have to sort out with other people. I think, you, I think you have the freedom of conscience to say that without poo-pooing someone who wants to make that, but then they also have to be good with you not doing that. And a helpful thing for me, for me personally, is like people that- Commercial stuff too, which is- which Yeah. Bars and restaurants. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Coexist with the, with the vision that That's right. I think you have the, the, the ethical and moral uh, positioning to, 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 to do that well and graciously and it, but also thank people that want it. So I think gratitude is the spring for living in a way that can affect your life positively. So if someone comes to me, my first expression is sincere gratitude because I don't want them to get a, a, a sour view on supporting artists. You, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I can't do this, but if I can find someone else that can, I will, if I can find a better fit. So that requires something we talk about with, within the organizations that we're a part of, which is it's important to both know and be known by each other. A lot of artists want to be known, but they're not willing to know anybody. Know me, but I'm not, I don't got time to know. My identity's here, I don't got time to know you, but check out me. You see what I'm saying? And so like, it's, it's actually more demanding, I think it's both. And that's how communities are built, to where you can say, I can't, but I know someone that can. And that conversation becomes really interesting because the artist that can needs the artist that doesn't want to. That conversation needs to happen to synergize and generate furtherance in terms of, of creativity.
You know what I mean? So you're a necessary cog in the way that you're designed and made to think that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Happy to talk more about that, by the way. Other, uh, yeah. If we did the, we, we've got a different TV upstairs. Okay. Like one other group, sure. Yeah, if you can, if you want to announce the Oh, the yeah. Prize winner, yeah. This is the hardest part. There's like 10 different folks. Oh, uh, this is painful. <laughs> It's not a joke. It's really hard. I stand by my convictions. I'm not going to be wishy-washy. But I'm telling you, this, this is sincerely hard. Normally, it's not this hard. Um, I think a couple things is, because I, I see several pieces that were excellent aesthetically, um, compositionally, uh, and, and crafted well, um, uh, ambitiously, um, what I started to look for is like the next step in vision and risk, uh, risk towards the ends of clarity, not risk towards the ends of being unclear, if that makes sense. Like, like th this, this steps forward and establishes well. And then um, I was torn between two pieces from this person. And so I, I will say that uh, this painting here is the one that um, dips it forward. And this is by Clarissa Kerr. Forgive me if I'm saying your last name wrong. Kerr. Um, and so, uh, a lot of the technical intangibles that are persistent in many excellent works here uh, made this very hard. Uh, like, um, you know, I, 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 I'm a fan of that piece. There's cut pieces in the back that I think could equally be the one I selected. There's an in incredible figurative work uh, that I think could easily be accepted. Um, I could go the route of the sculpture back here. Like, sincerely, I'm just telling you pieces that, like, demanded something of me. The kind of radioactivity of the floral painting there is really something, really something. Um, there are some little pieces uh, that have like bones in them. They're collage pieces. Like those are those are intense. There's like something really wonderful about those. The photography here that almost starts to become more like painting. So there there's a lot of options, and it was painful and difficult. But at the end of the day, I kept coming back to those two pieces. And coming to see him in person, sort of like in your gut, just solidified it for me. So best of show. Uh, congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah.